Good evening and welcome to News Review. Commonwealth Park was opened to the public this week with the official inauguration taking place on Thursday. The Chief Minister described it as not the government's but the people's park and thanked all those who'd been involved in its design, funding and creation. At today's inauguration, Fabian Bigardo recalled the exact moment when the idea for Commonwealth Park came to him. As he parked his car there three years ago, he said, he realized it was a waste of a prime resource in Gibraltar, namely an expanse of land. With the project subsequently becoming a manifesto commitment for the GSLP Liberals, today visitors set foot in Commonwealth Park for the first time. Well, I'll tell you the secret, I think I used to sometimes park relatively legally just about here sometimes and to see the whole place change and to have been transformed into what I believed it could be is not just uh, transformational physically, it shows you what the quality of democracy in Gibraltar really is about. People saw the designs in our manifesto, this is what they were voting for. This and the refurbishment of the forgotten estates down in the north area of Gibraltar and Moorish Castle Estate, all the other things that were there and we are slowly delivering to the people of Gibraltar on everything that we committed ourselves to deliver. They chose this park on the 9th of December 2011 and today we deliver it to them. The park was designed by landscape consultant Mark Gregory, working off the initial concept laid out in the manifesto. Construction began early last year, with the total cost amounting to £5.6 million, £3.4 million of which was funded by the government. 1.7 million has come from the European Union, so it's good access to the funding that the European Union provides. 700,000 pounds has come from the Consumer Trust. That's a fabulous contribution from the Consumer Trust to the people of Gibraltar. They do a lot of funding of education, etc., which affects and changes and transforms the lives of the individuals who are lucky enough to get those uh, uh, grants from them, but this grant from them can be enjoyed by the whole of our community as well, and three point something million from the government of Gibraltar to make up that funding. This is, in my view, excellent use of taxpayers' money because taxpayers and non-taxpayers together are going to enjoy the park for many years to come. And in terms of ongoing maintenance? So... The cost of ongoing maintenance has been determined, but it's not going to be quite as high as some of the social media figures uh, are suggesting or banding about. Of course, it's going to be an ongoing cost. We're trying to keep that cost down to a minimum. We're trying to recycle water. We're trying to ensure that everything that we can do to keep the recurring cost of this park down um, is done. And I'm sure that we'll be able to do it for uh, as cheap uh, as possible, but ensuring that we have real value for money for the taxpayer. The park includes a bandstand, lakes and water features and lift access, as well as both open lawns and areas shaded by trees. As well as being a green area in the heart of Gibraltar, the government's keen to point out it's also ecologically green, featuring, for example, efficient LED lighting. With all this for visitors to enjoy today, the park also has CCTV cameras and security guards to ensure it remains in pristine condition. The whole park is designed to be used and not abused, but the grass, for example, is not grass that we want people to keep off. We want people to come onto the grass, we want them to enjoy it, play football with your family, play rugby with your family at the weekend, come here and sit on the grass and have your lunch during the week. This is going to become our Hyde Park or our Central Park, and I want people to really enjoy it, and if that means spending money in stopping people abusing it, well, so be it, unfortunately. The next session of Parliament will see the second reading of the Commonwealth Park Act, which aims to ensure that any future proposed changes to the park's use will also have to be agreed upon in Parliament. Over the past week, Sir Geoffrey Grigson has heard all the closing arguments in Gibraltar's longest ever criminal trial. All three Maracha brothers, together with Leanne Turnbull, have pleaded not guilty to both counts of conspiracy to defraud millions of pounds of client monies. Representing Leanne Turnbull, Anne Kotcher QC asked the Supreme Court judge to consider what the purpose would be of long-term dishonesty given that Ms Turnbull, as an employee, did not benefit from the alleged fraud, not even a single Rolex, she said. In his concluding statement, Defence Counsel Chris Finch said Solomon Marache was a decent and loyal mm. man who may have made errors of judgment through loyalty, but he was not dishonest. 
John Cooper QC, Isaac Maracha's lead counsel, said the then senior partner was not a calm hand at the helm of a conspiracy, but rather a hard-working and successful lawyer based in the UK, who, upon learning of his firm's problems, came back to Gibraltar to try to save his life's work. And at no time did Benjamin Marache intend to steal clients' money or property. At no time did he intend to defraud his clients, let alone agree to do so with anyone else. The legal team for Marachenko's former managing partner highlighted these points as being central to their client's defence. Having dismissed the jury in October, the High Court judge, Sir Geoffrey Grigson, will now take a few weeks to digest evidence submitted over the past eight months. Meanwhile, the Chief Justice, Anthony Dudley, is considering a constitutional challenge made on behalf of Benjamin Marache, which argues that Sir Geoffrey was unconstitutionally appointed. If upheld, it could mean the whole trial is considered a nullity. Mr Justice Dudley has said he'll be delivering his judgment before Sir Geoffrey delivers his. That means sometime in the next two weeks. As of this week, everyone in Gibraltar will be able to pay their housing rents, check the housing lists and book MOT or driving tests online. The first of the e-government services were being rolled out by Number 6 Convent Place, described by the Chief Minister as a landmark development. Jonathan Sacramento asked the Chief Minister what citizens would be able to do at this stage. Well, only the basics at this stage, but it's the beginning of being able to interact much more fully with the government in the future. So today, you'll be able to check, for example, where you are on the housing waiting list, and you'll be able to book your MOT test without having to come down to the MOD test centre or even having to pick up the phone. And you'll be able to see all the times that are available and choose the one that's more convenient to you. This is really the beginning of what you are going to be able to do. And getting to the next stage involves not so much the technology that the government already has available, but knowing that it is you, a person that is identifying themselves to us, that we are dealing with when we disclose confidential information and when we take your payment. And that's why the chip and pin ID card, which is another one of our manifest your commitments has to be in place before you can actually have that next level of your government that should come before the end of the year or shortly thereafter. So give us an example of e-government services that will be available in the future. Well, you should see everything that you now interact with the government with in person or uh, with a piece of paper being able to happen electronically. And the next step after e-government, which is even more exciting, is to move to a totally paperless administration. Not that people would not have papers in their office, but that in interacting with individuals, even if you were to turn up at a government counter, you should be able to do just about everything using a booth or a touch screen available at the counter without having to interact with anyone and without having to give them an actual piece of paper. That's the future. That's where we hope to be in the next uh, year or two years. In a world where sites like Twitter and Amazon and Google can be hacked, what uh, level of security is there for this government portal for hackers who want to gain access, for example, to uh, clients' credit card details? Well, the, the whole idea is to do this once we get to the next stage with uh, the pit, chip and pin uh, system in order to make it even more secure than it is today. Of course, we will be hacked. Of course, we will constantly suffer attacks, not just from those who want to perhaps steal information, but those that simply want to demonstrate that they can hack the government of Gibraltar and people from uh, our northern neighbor might want to try and do that just for kicks. So we spend a lot of money on security. We spend a lot of money in ensuring that those things can't happen. But the best systems in the world, the systems of the FBI and of the CIA are subject sometimes to successful hacking, so nobody should expect that the government's website is going to be totally inviolable. That is absolutely impossible, unfortunately. Pedestrians and vehicles endured more frontier queues this week, and there was some confusion on the Frontier Hotline service, which gives a real-time account of the length of the frontier queue. At one point, it confused callers by stating the queue was five hours and minutes later saying it was two hours. A government spokesperson said the automated system is on trial and now needs to be recalibrated to take account of the special circumstances at the frontier. Meanwhile, the chief minister visited the completed works carried out by HM Customs to improve frontier security and tackle smuggling. These include a purpose-built vehicle search facility equipped to search both incoming and outgoing vehicles. 
On his visit, Mr. Picardo also opened the frontier's newest green lane, meaning that cars incoming are now streamlined through either two red or three green lanes. I think this demonstrates two things. First of all, that Gibraltar is responsible and has acted in keeping of the recommendations of the EU Commission, and we've done so in a timely way. We've replied on time, and we've actually taken the steps required on time. We haven't just in writing said we're going to do it. We've demonstrated that where there is a will, you can actually deliver what the Commission required in the time allowed. And if little Gibraltar can do that, there's absolutely no excuse whatsoever for Spain to have done absolutely nothing, as we have seen that they have. Now, th there's also another factor here, which is the government's own initiative, absent the Commission's requirements. And you can see from the gates that have been added be to underneath the uh, airport area and the rest of the measures that we've taken, that all of this also goes towards making Gibraltar more secure, in particular in the silent hours, where the area beyond the airport is now not going to be accessible at all. Two local men were found guilty of causing grievous bodily harm at the end of a trial this week at the Supreme Court. A jury of nine found former security guards at Harbour Views, Kevin Finlinson and Dylan Juice, guilty of assaulting a handyman at the same estate in 2012. The jury heard live evidence from both the complainants and defendants, as well as a witness to the assault. The RGP's forensic examiner gave evidence about the injuries to those involved in the fight. The complainant had suffered a fractured bone in his hand, leading to the charge of grievous bodily harm. The jury deliberated for over five hours before returning a majority verdict of guilty for both defendants. Kevin Finlinson and Dylan Juice will be sentenced on the 3rd of July. A new multi-storey car park at Eastern Beach was officially opened by the Chief Minister this week to coincide with the start of this year's bathing season. Fabian Picardo says this new car park is in line with and even exceeds his government's commitment to improve car parking in the area. The new car park provides parking facilities for 436 cars. This is significantly greater than both the 159 parking spaces previously available and the government's manifesto commitment to provide 300 spaces. Parking is free every day from 8 in the morning to 10 in the evening with charges for overnight parking. And we'll be back with more of this week's news after the break. <laughs>